You are listening to By the Book, because if you don't look at the world through the Bible, you will never see it right. This is Alan Griffith, your host for episode 71 of By the Book. We have been talking about uh, communication from God, how to hear from God, how not to hear from God, a lot of things to avoid if you want to hear from God. But I want to move forward with that and uh, get us thinking a little bit more along those lines. And the first thing I want to talk about, really based on our discussion from the last episode, is this. And when we were into 1 Corinthians 13 to talk about it. But basically, you and I need to settle on this truth. This will be a blessing for you. It'll help you. It'll keep you stable. All of God's messaging of prophecy and revelation is complete. It's in a book, and the book, of course, is the Bible. Now, that's important because there's so many sources out there that are trying to give a message supposedly coming from God or about God, and the sources are not Scripture. They're not the Bible. Uh, There are all these other things, and a lot of it, as we've been talking about, leads to spiritism and contact with the spirit world, uh, opening the door to demonism, and all that kind of stuff. And I want to tell you something. I, I beg you to settle on this. That is, there's no new truth coming from God. There's no new revelation, no new prophecy that's going to come from God. You have it. You have it in the book that I hope you often hold in your hands. And you can look at that book, you can look at that Bible, and you can say, I have the Word of God in my hands. Now, we're not going to go off on the tangent today of uh, Bible manuscripts and versions and all those things. It's a a tragedy to me that there are so many um, books out there today that uh, are claimed to be some version of the Bible. And again, I'm not going to get into it deeply. I uh, preach from and study from the King James Version. Uh, I do so because I believe it best represents the Hebrew manuscripts and the Greek manuscripts that are the message and truth of the Word of God. Again, I don't want to get into all that detail. Uh, I've written a little booklet called Does It Matter? Uh, If you're interested in, in reading it, I'd be happy to put it into your hands. And when I say that, no charge. Uh, I won't charge you to mail it to you. I'm not going to charge you for the book. And if you send me your address, I'm not going to be contacting you in other ways for other things. I'm not going to put you on a mailing list. None of that. But if you say, well, I'd like to read something uh, that's fairly simple to discuss this issue, well, again, a little booklet called Does It Matter? My basic view is that the best Greek text behind the New Testament is what's called the majority text. It's called the majority text because the majority of Greek manuscripts that are available are of this text, this this, uh, particular version, if you will, of the Greek. So in any event, uh, if you're interested, I'd be happy to send you that, that book, no charge, whatever. But I want you to come to the point, I hope you are at that point, where you can hold the Bible in your hands and say to yourself, I have the Word of God in my hands. I have the message of the God of the universe in my hands. I have 
his truth in my hands. Now, the challenge, of course, is what? To study it, to know it. Uh, There's no doubt uh, that some of what the Bible says is easy, and there is some of what the Bible says that is difficult to understand. And we have an obligation, and we're going to talk a little bit about that. We have an obligation to study it intelligently. However, underneath all of that, that does need to take place, but underneath all of that is a marvelous text from the Psalm, Psalm 119.89. Here's what it says. Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. You know what that tells me? God has given us his word. And when I hold this Bible in my hands, I am very content to say, this thing is settled. This thing is settled. God isn't going to be making any changes. And I'm glad for that. I read things that that stir me in a lot of ways. And some things I don't understand. But I, I hold that book in my hands and I say, this I know. This thing is settled. It's timeless truth. It's eternal truth that is being reflected in this book. I don't have to jump all over the place and wonder. I need to know the book. The Lord Jesus made this statement recorded for us in John 17. He was praying. He was praying uh, the night before his crucifixion. And as he prayed to the Father, he made this statement. Thy word is truth. Thy word is truth. So when I hold the Bible in my hands and I study it and I consider what it says about a variety of topics, you know what I come back to all the time? The book is true. The book is true. Paul wrote in the in the book of Romans, let God be true and every man a liar. And I stand on that. God's word is true. God is the one who established truth. And God gives us a message, and uh, it's true. So there's all kinds of of ideas that come out uh, in the world that uh, contradict the Bible. And, of course, there are people who always want to throw the Bible aside because whatever, some new scientific thing, whatever it is. Listen, the Bible is true. And when, when science catches up with the Bible, it's science that will change or have to admit its error. Uh, One of the things that really has burdened me is the whole issue of abortion. Listen, the Bible is clear. The Bible is clear that life begins at conception. I don't care what any scientist says. I don't care what they, they try to show. The Bible is very clear. And the fact is that now science really has caught up with the Bible. But in, in brazenness, and rebellion against God. Uh, you got doctors who are saying today, oh, well, we know it's a life, but we're going to kill it anyway. And you got some to the point now who are saying, even let the baby be born, and we're going to either let it die or, or we're going to put it to death. I mean, that's where we are. But for a long time, it was argued, well, we don't know when life begins. Well, we do know. Science has now proved it, but God told us a long time ago. So there, there it stands. Uh, we have all this confusion today about, uh, you know, sexual things and genders and all that garbage. Well, you know what? The Bible's clear. Uh, men ought to be with men. Women ought to be with women. Uh, there's only two genders. There's not 150 or what the latest supposed number is. Uh, I hold this book and people, yeah, but this, yeah, but that. I don't care about all that stuff. I hold this book in my hands and without apology, I say this book is true. I may not understand it all, but the more I understand, the more I see its truthfulness, and it is absolutely wonderful. Now, I don't know where you are uh, when it comes to that kind of thing, but I hope you are where I am. I hope you take this Bible and say this, I may not understand it all, but this one thing I know, this thing is true. And I might need to catch up with it, and the world might need to catch up with it. But when all is said and done, I hold in my hands the Word of God. It is forever settled in heaven. And if I want to hear from God, I'm going to hear from Him through this book. I'm not going to hear from Him in in all of these other things. There's no 
new prophets out there, no new prophecy out there. Uh, There's no message that's going to come from the spirit world. Listen, I hold it in my hands. And if you want God to speak to you, and that's what we got into this discussion about, communication from God. If you want God to speak to you, you're going to find his message. And believe me, it can be extremely personal as well as very broad. But what God has to say is in this book. Second Peter chapter 1 finds Peter giving his testimony ultimately about his message and his writings and what he's trying to communicate to these people, and that it is uh, a message that he wrote to them so that they would have it once he passed away. And in the midst of it, he's going to make commentary on the scriptures. Now, the scriptures weren't finished yet when he was writing. He understood that. But he's making testimony about the scripture. And a part of what he is talking about, beginning in verse 15 and following, is this that he personally saw the truth of God unfold in the person of Jesus Christ. He saw Jesus Christ for who he was, he saw Jesus Christ as the Messiah, the Savior the majestic one. And he talks about this Mount of Transfiguration experience, where he and James and John were taken by the Lord Jesus up to the Mount, what we call the Mount of Transfiguration. We're not sure what the mountain was, but there the Lord Jesus was transfigured before them. He, Christ, who had always looked like a man, all of a sudden puts on display his divine glory. And Peter says in 2 Peter 1 and verse 16 that he and the others were, listen, eyewitnesses of the majesty of Jesus Christ. Now, I want to tell you, eyewitness testimony is pretty powerful. You go to a court, eyewitness testimony is very, very important. Peter goes on and says not only were they eyewitnesses, but then they heard the voice of God the Father. And so, 2 Peter 1 and verse 17, he, the Lord Jesus, received from God the Father. Now you have God the Father in heaven. Here's the Lord Jesus, the Son of God on earth. Peter says, we receive uh, the message from God the Father. And it was a message of honor and glory. And it's a message that said simply this. Here was the words of the Father. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Now, Peter, James, and John heard God the Father say that as they are looking at the Son of God, Jesus Christ, in the fullness of his glory. What an experience it must have been. He says in verse 18, And this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. That's quite a statement. Would you believe Peter based on that eyewitness account? We'd have no reason not to. But now listen to what he says. Listen to what Peter goes on to say in verse 19, 2 Peter 1. He said this, We have also a more sure word of prophecy. Wait a minute, Peter. You're just glorying in this eyewitness experience of yours. You are telling us about God the Father speaking from heaven. You're telling us about the majesty of Jesus Christ. And now, after giving us that description, you're going to next say, but we have a more sure word of prophecy than your eyewitness account? That's what he says. And then he says this to his readers. He says, whereunto, this more sure word of prophecy, whereunto ye do well that ye take heed. Now, let me tell you in advance where he's going. 
the more sure word of prophecy, the more sure message than the eyewitness experience is the message of the scriptures. It's the Bible. Listen to how Peter describes it. He says, we have also a more sure word of prophecy whereunto you do well that you take heed. And here it is, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place. That's his first description of the Bible. He says, the Bible is like a light that shines in a dark place. Listen, we live in a very dark world. And we live in a dark world religiously. And I want you to imagine for a moment being in a dark room and all of a sudden a light is turned on. I want to tell you, you would give great attention to that light. For one reason, it would dispel the darkness. But as I've often pointed out, if I look here in my office at my light, uh, there's nothing very attractive about it, to be honest with you. I mean, it's, you know, it's a nice little chandelier and it gives light and, and whatever. And I'm glad it does give light. But Peter said, but I want to tell you about this light, this message. I, I want to take you another step further. So here's what he then says. He says, take heed as unto a light that shineth in the dark place. And then he says this, until the day dawn. What's that mean? Well, again, think about sitting in a dark place and somebody turns a light on. It's just a, you know, what, 60-watt incandescent light. Oh, boy, we have light. But then, at then, the day dawns. The sun begins to rise. Did you see the sun rise this morning? I confess I did not. But I have seen the sun rise. And I want to tell you something. It's marvelous. It's wonderful. It's it's beautiful. You just are there and, and you just look at it and you watch it take place. The dawning of the day. Well, here's what Peter's trying to do. He's trying to move us. First of all, the scripture is like that light bulb. It gives the light. But all of a sudden, and I want to tell you, as you spend more time in the scripture, you begin to see it differently. It's not just the light bulb. It's the, the day dawning. I mean, this book, it gets more and more wonderful. It stirs you deeply as you study it and see it. That's what Peter's trying to get us to think about the Bible. And then he takes it one step further. He says, it's a light shines in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. Now, what's the day star? Well, the day star is the sun. And he makes reference to the dawning of the day and the sun beginning to rise. And again, it's magnificent and beautiful. But you know, as that sun continues to rise, what does it do? It gets to the middle of the heavens, and now it just encompasses everything. Everything is affected by that light, by its brilliance, by its brightness. And you appreciated the dawning of the day, but now there's the, the sun, noonday, fully risen, affecting everything. Listen, that's the Bible. That's the Bible in your life, in my life. You first hear the message like a light gets turned on in the darkness. Oh, boy, I'm grateful for that light. Then you go out and you see the dawning of the day. Oh, man, this is incredible light. This is marvelous. And then all of a sudden, there's the day star high in the sky lighting everything. That's the Bible. That's what it does to you when you take it in. That's why he says, take heed. Take heed to this message, this truth. And then Peter goes on. We've been in verse 19. Here we are, 2 Peter 1, verse 20. He says, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture, see, he's talking about the Scripture, he says, no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. Now, that term is uh, interpreted in different ways, but I want to suggest to you the, the idea of that is this. Number one, nobody has their own story out of the Bible. You know, oh, I see it this way. No, there is truth that is there for everybody. 
but also I think it relates to the writing of the Scripture. And here we are, we are reading the writing of Peter, but you know the message isn't Peter's. It's not Peter's private message to give. It's the, it's the message of God. And for Paul, it was the message of, of God. That's why verse 21 says this, for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man. Isaiah's writings were not Isaiah's. Jeremiah's writings were not Jeremiah. Zechariah's writings were not Zechariah's. All this was God's. And what Peter is writing was God's message. And so he says, prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost, by the Holy Spirit. Now take this Bible in your hands, and I want you to look at it. I want you to think about it. I want you to realize what this book is. This is the word of the living God. It is more powerful. It is more sure than somebody's personal testimony, somebody's eyewitness testimony, more sure than that. It's a book that just unfolds before you in brilliance as you study it, and it is not a book that belongs to any individual as a reader or a writer. It is a book that came by the will of God. Holy men of God wrote or spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. That's the Bible. That's the Bible. Now, again, people put a lot of value on somebody's personal testimony. Peter said, this is, this is better than my personal testimony, even though I can tell you I was there, I saw Christ in his glory. But believe the book. I'm going to be gone, is Peter's words. I'm, I'm leaving. I'm going to die. <laughs> but I'm leaving you the scriptures. It's the blessed word of God. That's the Bible. That's the Bible. That's why the Bible, as we've already seen, tells us that if something is said or done or whatever, and it doesn't match up with the scriptures, throw it out. Somebody says, yeah, but I had this experience. Yeah, but it doesn't match up with the scriptures. Throw it out. Yeah, but I had an angel talk to me. I saw the Virgin Mary, I blah, 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 whatever it might be. Throw it out. You come back to this book. It may not seem as exciting as you seeing some vision in front of you, but that vision probably comes from the devil or something you ate. This book is the word of the living God. Love it, stand by it, accept it, believe it, live by it. Second, Second Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, verse 17, two verses you're probably familiar with. But here's what Paul wrote. He said, all scripture, that's the book you hold in your hand. That's your Bible. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. Peter said, holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Paul describes this this way. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. This term inspiration is a, uh, a term that means breathed out. Actually, the term is a combination. It's God breathing out. The term is theopneustos, God breathing out. I hold this Bible in my hands. You know what it is? It's not the writings of a Paul or a Peter or whoever. It is a message that was breathed out by God. It's his word. I hold it in my hands. I can read it. I can study it. I can hear from God by knowing what this book says. So Paul said, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. And as you might expect, he goes on and says this, it is profitable for doctrine. This book will tell you what is true and false and right and wrong. It'll tell you what to believe and what not to believe. And you got a lot of preachers and teachers and whoever it is out there who are going to give you their view. Come back to the book. The scriptures are profitable for doctrine. They are profitable for reproof. And that means to expose error. And I love, I love the Bible. 
for that very point, because there's a whole lot of error out there, and, and a, much error is in the realm of religion and religious teaching. Well, I hold a book in my hands, and you do too, that exposes that error. I read the book, I see what they're saying, and I'm saying, I know what they're saying, I know what they're doing is wrong, because I hold in my hands the book that is right and tells me what's right. It's profitable for correction. I'm grateful for that. This book has corrected me over and over and over and over again. You get ideas and thoughts and you wonder and whatever, you go back to the book and the Bible says, no, that's not right. Let me tell you what is right. Let me change the way you think. Oh boy, God has done that for me so many times. I'm sure he's done it for you. And then it says, this book is also profitable for instruction and in righteousness. That's often what people are looking for. I want to know what to do. I want to know how to live. And that's why I went to see the, the palm reader. That's why I went to see the whatever it might be. And God says, look, do you want instruction in righteousness? Do you want instruction in how to live right, how to do right? That's this book. This is the message of God. This is God communicating with you. And verse 17 goes on and says this, 2 Timothy 3, 17, that, in other words, the book is inspired and it's profitable, so on, that purpose, that, that the man of God may be perfect, we've talked about that word before, complete, mature is what it means, not sinlessly perfect, that the man of God may be perfect, he might be mature, he might learn, and then thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Again, this book will tell you how to live, and we're going to get into that because this is God communicating with us. This is God saying, I'm going to tell you how to think, how to live, what to do, what not to do. This is God's word. Second Timothy also has another passage here that I want to relate to. And uh, it's in verse 15. And again, a text you might be familiar with. But it helps us with the book because we're not going to have time, I don't think, in, in this episode. If we do have time, we'll turn to it. But in 2 Peter chapter 3, uh, Peter is going to tell us that there are some things in the Bible that are hard to be understood. And I'm glad he says that because it's true. Uh, there are things that, that uh, I've studied, and I'm still trying to get a better and better understanding of them. And it's been my privilege to study the Bible for a long time. But there are some things that are hard to be understood. Well, it's with that and other things in mind that Paul wrote to Timothy. Timothy was a young preacher. And here is what Paul said to him. Study. Now, that term is not so much as open the book, although that is included in it. But the term itself, study here, is a term that means give diligence, make an effort. And here it is, give diligence, which includes study of the books. Study to show thyself approved unto God. Now, you can't be approved unto God unless you are doing what this book tells you to do. But here's what he said, study to show thyself approved unto God a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. I'll tell you, when I teach and preach the book, I don't want to be ashamed. I don't want to say the wrong thing. I don't, I don't want to give the wrong message. I'm sure you don't either. But then he said this, rightly dividing the word of truth. And that opens up uh, a large area for discussion that we don't have time to pursue very far in this episode. The term rightly dividing the word of truth means this. Rightly divide means to cut it straight. To cut it straight. That's interesting. But the idea is, is this, that the Bible needs to be understood. It needs to be properly divided. Why? Because there are some things in the Bible that are to me and some things that were not written to me as a New Testament. Christian. 
So I need to be careful about those things. For instance, much of the Old Testament was written to Israel. The the whole Mosaic law was given to Israel. I don't live under the law. You don't live under the law. Well, if I go to the law, part of Scripture, and I begin to read that, and I think, oh, okay, i got to do that, well, then I'm going to get very, very confused. You and I need to rightly divide the word of truth. What is for me? What was maybe not written to me, but there's some application of it to me? Where are the things that are timeless truths as opposed to the things that are specific for a particular people or particular person or time? Well, all that needs attention, and that's work. Studying the Bible is work, to be sure. We need to be willing to do it because I'll tell you, when you cut it straight and you study the book, you fall in love with it more and more and more. Does God speak? He sure does. Don't expect it when you're laying in bed tonight to have some angel come and talk to you. It's not going to happen. If it does, reject it, turn away from it, ignore it, whatever it is, that's not God. You hold a book in your hands. Doesn't seem very exciting to some people. Oh, a book? Yes, and I want to tell you it is a thrilling book. God bless you. Till next time.